Tack för det. Good evening, class. It's just me between you and the bar. I don't know about you guys, but my brain is entirely full. The past uh, two days have been really quite something. Um, as David says, I'm the editor at large of Wired Magazine, so my job is to travel the world and find new ideas, new things, new ways of doing stuff, innovations, disruption, all of those great adjectives that we've heard over the past couple of days. And I come back from my travels a much wiser and more tired man than I left with a single message for all of you. You are all here, the finest minds of your generation, people who really do get stuff done. And I'm here to ask on behalf of the rest of the people, on behalf of all of the people on the other side of this glass, I'm here to ask you one thing. Please stop innovating. Stop it, really. Really. Because the truth is, we can't keep up. The pace of change is so high that anyone outside this room is right now, as we speak, having a breakdown. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this. If you go on the tube, you'll know, if you look people in the eye, especially if you're holding some form of electronic device, if you look people in the eye, they are losing it. <laughs> we are in a major crisis. And it's all your fault. Every man, woman, and child in this room, the innovators, please stop. Now, don't really stop, but you have to be aware of the problem. You have to be aware of the problem with society. Society, culture, etiquette, all of these things doesn't travel at the same speed. They don't improve at the same speed as the technology that everybody in this room pushes out. This isn't just a digital thing, of course. New stuff is always, always scary. Let's take a cultural example. Think back, 29th of May, 1913. Stravinsky is in Paris. It's the opening night of his new ballet, The Rite of Spring. He's in the theater. It's going to be the most amazing ballet anybody has ever seen. Nijinsky himself did the choreography. The Ballet Russe are about to dance it. The ballet dancers are standing on stage. The bassoon, as you all know, strikes the opening note. It's beautiful. Until suddenly, it becomes discordant. The rhythms are all out of shape. The crowd gets re restless. Somebody shouts something. Somebody throws a punch. And then another. A fight breaks out in the front row. Then a riot. Somebody storms the stage. Rugby tackles one of the ballet dancers, who's wearing basically nothing. Huge fight breaks out. Up in the back of the theater, Sanson, the famous French composer, is witnessed putting his head in his hands and screaming, no, before he runs out of the theater, horrified at this new form of music. It's a complete disaster. The innovation that Stravinsky brought was too much. But then, a year later, Almost to the day, the same orchestra meets in the same hall. They play the same music in front of pretty much the same crowd. And at the end of it, the cheering is heard all across Paris. Stravinsky is lifted onto the shoulders of the crowd and borne down the street a hero. The culture had caught up with his innovation, and he changed the face of music. Now, this happens an awful lot. Let's take jazz as an example. At the same time as Stravinsky was being heralded in Paris, the United States, jazz, was on the rise. Its improvis improvisational style, its emphasis on small teams, really makes it the digital startup of musical styles. And just as the old folks of today might deride Silicon Roundabout, the old folks of that time derided jazz. One academic, Professor Henry von Dyck of Princeton University, he said, 
It is not music at all. It is merely an irritation of the nerves of hearing, a sensual teasing of the strings of physical passion. It was quite popular. So, even so, even though that jazz was called the devil's music and was considered to be evil, only a few years later, big band jazz was used by the government to entertain the troops. Here's how it sounded. Mr. What you call and what you doing tonight? Hope you're in the mood because I'm feeling just right. How's about a corner in the table for two? Where the music's mellow and some gay rendezvous. There's no chance for man's with the blue attitude. You've got to do some dancing to be in the mood. In the mood. That's you that got it. In the mood. Your ear was body. In the mood. Oh, what a honey. Shocking, isn't it? Well, you know, at the time it was, for some. The style of music was considered to be morally hazardous. But you know, times change, and the things that were once considered shocking are now considered normal. But of course, indeed, things that were once considered normal are now considered shocking. Something like this. The people gather around when he gets on the stand, and when he plays, he gets a hand. The 1940s hit, Beat Me Daddy, Ate to the Bar. A great hit in 1940, but pretty much unmentionable today. Now, as innovators, everybody in this room, we really have to be aware of how society at large deals with the things that we release. I mean, we talk about world-changing innovation. That's what we've been talking about for the past two days. But we have to remember that our conversations completely freak out everybody else. We have to look to the 50s for an example of this. A very, very nervous young man appeared on television for the first time. So nervous, in fact, that he couldn't stop his legs from shaking. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Crying all the time. Well, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. When they said you were high-class, well, that was just a lie. When they said you were high-class, well, that was just a lie. Well, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. Now, Elvis's dance was an accident. Yes, I think so. <laughs> Elvis's dance was an accident. He didn't mean to do it in the first instance, but it really captured the imagination. People screamed for it. The girls went crazy. And so he kept doing it. It was a beta dance, and it went into a full product. <laughs> you know, sometimes, though, new ideas are so crazy that they come completely out of left field. They come completely out of the blue. And they, in fact, may maybe take many years to, for people to fully understand them. For those of us who've been in the digital industry for 10, 15, 20 years, you'll recognize this. We'll have seen ideas over and over again over the years that come around and around and fail and fail until one day they stick. There are some ideas in other parts of culture which also took a long time for people to understand. For example, in 1952, the American composer John Cage wrote a piece in three separate movements, which he called 4 minutes 33 seconds. Now, we're going to perform 4 minutes and 33 seconds, but it is an incredibly complicated piece of music. And so I need you all to concentrate very hard. I'm going to uh, conduct the girls. Um, we're not going to perform the entire piece. For those of you who know the piece, uh, you'll understand why. Um, 
but we're going to go on as long as we can bear it. <clears throat> Ladies? This is a difficult bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the reaction to Cage's piece, which is, in fact, uh, three movements, as you can see, of complete silence, uh, was very marked. People either loved it or they just didn't get it at all. You know? And that's OK. There will be many ideas that people in this room have that are massively supported by some of us and completely rejected by others. So that's cool. We have to live with that. But you know, sometimes we're not even allowed to live with an idea we don't like. Some sorts of innovation is so beyond the realms of contemporary culture that people can't deal with it at all. Peter's talk from a few hours ago really emphasizes that. A good example is in May 1981, the Dead Kennedys, the West Coast punk band, who released a song that was so shocking, so disturbing, that it caused them to not only be dropped by their record label, but also banned by the BBC, censored. Their song sounded like this. Went to a party. I danced all night. I drank 16 beers and started up a fight. And now I'm the English. You're out of luck. Cause I'm rolling down the stairs too drunk to fuck. I'm so getting fired. <laughs> Perhaps it didn't sound exactly like that. But anyway, nevertheless, as we've heard, you know, innovation can sometimes be snuck in under the radar. It's really a matter of presentation. It's a matter of branding. It's a matter of communication. It's a matter of the visuals, really. You can get the same message across, even a very political message, a message of, of great rage, like society feels today, if you uh, if you sweeten it, if you rhyme it, the great master of this was Mr. Ice Cube. Straight out of Compton, crazy motherfucker named Ice Cube. From a gang called Niggas with Attitude. When I'm called off, I get a sawn off. Squeeze the trigger and buddies are hauled off. You two boy, if you fuck with me, the police are gonna have to come and get me off your ass. That's how I'm going out for the punk motherfuckers that's showing out. Straight out of Compton, straight out of Compton. So, what have we heard here? Well, we've heard music whose newness has caused rioting, censorship, sniggering, and mass confusion. It's brought about accusations of devilry and claims that it's not even music at all. We've heard things that have been blamed for the downfall of society more than once. And all of these claims have been made against technology as well. But yet, today, when we hear the songs, they're all rather quaint. You know, Straight Out of Compton was released in the year that people graduating this year were born in. So what will today's children make of, say, Lady Gaga? Will the lyrics shock? I mean, they are quite dodgy. <laughs> Show me 
come high, make sure when what I got can we buy, can we buy, no, you can read my poker face. She ain't got to love nobody. Can we buy, can we buy, no, you can read my poker face. She ain't got to love nobody. So, all of the music we've heard, heard today has gone on to be part of our culture. The shocking newness has been largely forgotten. But it's perhaps only the artists who were originally vilified for their bad ways, misunderstood by the mainstream, criticized by the press, criticized by politicians, maybe it's only them who actually go on to find that their work survives. All of these artists, from the Andrew sisters through to NWA, pushed the world forward and laid the basis for the music of tomorrow. They did so by ignoring the status quo. By pushing ahead, regardless of criticism, regardless of how much they freaked out the straits. And so it is with the technology. Yesterday, we heard from George Dyson about the beginnings of the digital revolution. And every speaker we've seen since then has, just as Wired does every month, highlighted the future ahead of us. And everyone here has taken flack for that future. Everyone in this room, I have no doubt, has tried to push things forward only to be considered by others as promoting devilry. But you know, we live in a world with really great difficulties. There are huge problems ahead of us. And at Wired, we believe that the biggest challenges are the ones that are most worth our attention. And you, everyone here, as part of the Wired family now, believe, I think, the same. But anything trying anything new is always going to be criticized until one day you wake up and you find that you're Elvis and you've changed the world. So, here then to the ones who came before us and the ones who have passed too early to the giants on whose shoulders we stand today. Here's to the crazy ones. But here too is to the future, to the better world that we can make, to the challenges that we'll face with enthusiasm and, uh, and brilliance. The world is a difficult and hard place today, but there are new tunes that we can sing. So let's go, have a drink, get some sleep. For tomorrow, we have to choose what work we're going to take on. Nothing is more important. Don't let anyone stop you. Good luck, everybody. Thank you, and see you next year. <laughs>